Welcome back to Grit Gym, guys. I have the just I feel uh, just extremely privileged at this moment. Uh, we have uh, the greatest of all time, in my opinion. It was fine. Uh, it was fine research, fine conditions. Dr. Stuart McGill. Uh, I just, I, Dr. McGill, I can't, I can't tell you what this means to me for you to be on. I've read, I've, I've literally bought every product that I've ever found from you. I've read every book and every word of every book. Uh, I get so much from it, and uh, I just, I. I I'm really thankful that you came on the show today. I can't tell you guys what uh what like the amount of information this guy has in that brain of his is insane. So, uh, Dr. McGill, do you mind introducing yourself a little bit to the Grit Gym crowd? Well, good afternoon, first of all, uh, Adam, and and thank you for funding my retirement. <laughs> uh, we uh, just happened to meet this past weekend in Chicago yeah. at the Perform Better meetings, and it was a pleasure to meet you and uh, all of your, your colleagues with you. Well, I was a professor for 32 years. I retired a couple of years ago uh, of spine biomechanics, uh, but that quickly broadened out. We originally started asking the question, how does the spine work 30 years ago? And from that, we then branched out what are the injury and pain mechanisms, uh, how can we quantify those and create very valid assessments of uh, very specific uh, back pain patterns and link them to uh, back to the mechanism. And that gave us a foundation for really targeted rehabilitation approaches. And then one of the greater joys in the last 20 years of my career or so was to then put it into a performance rubric and uh, see some of the top athletes from virtually every Olympic sport, uh, MMA, the uh, professional sports, etc. And uh, in measuring those great athletes and seeing them as back pain patients, we, we really learned what was possible. Sure. You know, what, what does the world's fastest man have and how do they um, organize their backs to create the terrific explosives, explosive uh, uh, hip propulsion, for example? Or what do the great strikers in the UFC have that uh, the rest of us mere mortals uh, don't have? Um, what does the great power lifters and Olympic lifters have? So um, it's, uh, that gives a summary, I guess, of uh, our experience and where our evidence uh, uh, came from. Yeah, that's a, like, it's, it was amazing to hear you talk and perform better about uh, some of the firsts that came along with like imaging and stuff like, uh, where you're the first uh, uh, time that, the first time that we ever caught an injury on imaging. And you showed it up there. I thought that was just a, that was really a very cool thing to see exactly what is actually going on. I, that's right. We we caught a power lifter uh, in 1987. That would have been. Uh, we were watching their spines as they lifted four, five, six hundred pounds off the ground through video fluoroscopy. And when he hurt his back, you could see it as a buckling yeah. mechanism between the second and third lumbar vertebra. Yeah, yeah. The fact, like it, everything about the human body fascinates me. But um, and I think a lot of it comes out of just personal story, real quick. Like I, I've dealt with uh, tons of hip and back issues uh, for, I mean, basically from the first growth spurt that I had on through all sports and everything it was the one thing that helped me back a ton. And and in life, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And reading your material just, uh, it, it definitely changed everything for me. And uh, lately, I've been noticing that you know. I spent the whole weekend sitting. We drove four hours to get there. Drove four hours home. Monday, my back was a wreck, and it and uh, I it was it was a perfect example of how these little reminders of spine hygiene uh, are such a big deal because that's all I practiced Monday and Tuesday was spine hygiene in my workout. You know uh, how you get up off the floor, how you lay back down, how you uh, get into a squat, how you get into a chair, uh, and now my back is. Just the, that little bit, those little tiny things along the way, I've, I, I don't feel amazing. Like my back doesn't feel amazing today, but it's definitely I can move around. And I think that's really interesting. Well, you you sacrificed a little bit of your training capacity by ignoring yeah. biology. And yeah. uh, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Adam, but did you use a lumbar support in your vehicle as you were driving? No, we didn't. Yeah. Okay. Just so jumped you in see, and ran. Just, 
such a simple thing like right. that or flying on an airplane uh if you can give your back that lumbar support when you arrive you will have much more biological capacity for load yeah. and uh that's of course for um i i know somewhat your age and you're right in the sweet spot for discogenic back pain but right there would have been a missed opportunity yeah yeah and i've definitely earned it along the way you had a during your practical you pulled somebody up and you said that you said well you've definitely earned your back pain and i was sitting in the back going yeah, yes, I have. <laughs> you're, you're really poor training. Yes, I have. Well, you know, we, we hear from these people, uh, different physicians and, and physical therapists who are really beyond their expertise when it comes to backs, and they end up blaming the patient. And they say, no, the pain is in your head. Yeah. And it's, uh, you, it's always a default. Pain always has a cause. It's not normal. And uh, there is a specific cause, and a thorough examination always shows the pain mechanism. Now you have a roadmap on A, what to do to desensitize the pain, and then B, allow the tissues to adapt, yeah. and uh, then build the person's foundation for, for pain-free uh, activity once again. But uh, no, it's, it's, it's not a mystery. And uh, it does take a lot of work, I might add. You know, my, do you think my, that that's part my, of it? Do you think it's Do you think it's part of it that we're just maybe underestimating how much work is actually involved in getting the spine to a healthier place? Well, here's the thing: if when I was a uh, a graduate student and a young professor, my senior orthopedic colleagues they would perform uh, orthopedic assessments and neurological assessments on their back pain patients. Uh, this has all been forgotten, and it's partly driven by time. You're lucky to get 10 minutes with a, a, a back expert these days. And uh, medical imaging, for example. Oh, let's send you off for an MRI. Well, that might help, but it only helps yeah. once you have the context of the assessment to know the feature that you you're seeing on an MR, is that an old scar that was 20 sure. years ago and no longer a pain mechanism, or is it something new? And we would call that a wound, but the MR shows the full history of that person's back. So it takes the uh, prior assessment of that individual so you can interpret those features uh, with pain. So the current practice of getting an MR and the radiologist never sees the patient, this should be outlawed. It's, it's just crazy medical practice. So I think several of these things are conspiring to dumb down the average clinician, whether they're a physical therapist or a, a, uh, a medic. Um, they've lost their ability to provoke the pain and understand what they just did to make it worse and then turn around and immediately take the person's pain away. So good provocative testing. I set aside three hours to do a thorough back exam just to show you the um, extent then, yeah. that, we, that we go through. But almost always we converge on a fairly precise and valid explanation of why that person has pain. Yeah. Yeah, that's just amazing. I could ask you questions down that rabbit hole, all, uh, but that would be just, we'd get into trainer speak really quick. And uh, I think we'd be outside of the people that are watching this realm. But um, can we go to some of like the, the causes of why people, like how they, how they build up to the, the injuries? Like for instance, the, I'm not, I've heard this many times that you didn't let your daughter do gymnastics. Is that, <laughs> is that accurate? Well, th that was a bit of a joke, but I'm so glad that she didn't. Um, and and uh, to, to be a, a good gymnast and to have injury resilience, you need a certain body type. Well, my wife was on the Canadian national team as one of our heavyweight rowers, and I used to be a, a banger in hockey and, and football. Neither of us are, are, are that small, nor do we have the type of spine that does well in gymnastics. So I'm so glad she played basketball. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. She's pretty tall, too. I got to meet her, too. As, uh, she's, a, she's a very classy young woman. That's, uh, it, well, we're we're very proud of her, and as you know, she's uh, I'm the world's worst businessman, so she looks <laughs> after the business side of all of this, and then I can work on the uh, medical side. Yeah, yeah, no, you got trying to be an expert at two things doesn't usually work out real well. But so, <laughs> but like beyond that, what would be the 
like what are the pitfalls of of any any sport? So you got jujitsu, like sports that go into a lot of let's call it spinal movement. You jujitsu, wrestling, gymnastics, um, like those would be your big ones, right? Yes. Well, uh, you've mentioned a few grappling sports. Let me just back up here for just a moment and let's okay. create a scientific principle that we can uh, use to underpin our conversation. Every system in biology has a tipping point. So imagine if you're vitamin D def deficient, okay. uh, you will be ill. But if we supplement with vitamin D, you get optimal health but only up to a point. If you keep taking more and more vitamin D, it then turns into a poison and you become ill. So do you see there's a tipping point there and sure. everything in biology has a tipping point. So now when you get into specific sports, the tipping. So let's just talk about tissue adaptation for one second. Um, to create muscle memory and good movement patterns that don't cause stresses in specific parts of the body that will eventually become painful and injury avoidance and performance enhancement, you create muscle memory patterns. Well, the neurologists call these engrams. You develop the engram while you're training. So this is why it's so important to move well, keep repeating those movements well, and when you get really tired, you start corrupting those good movement patterns. Yeah. Well, if you're doing 10 Olympic lifts, the first three are grooving a good engram. Then the fourth, yeah. the fifth, the sixth, as the form deteriorates, now you're corrupting that perfect movement pattern that you need to, to uh, not only a deadlift or a power clean, but for your clients, probably more important than that is picking your baby out of the crib at two o'clock yeah. in the morning for feeding. These right. are the hip hinging patterns, spine stiffness, and all the rest of it that need to survive and transfer from the uh, grit gym and into the person's life that makes them injury resilient all day long. But my point is the excellent coaching that you do is so important because we did a study with the Pensacola Fire Department. We took one group and they just did exercises for sets and reps, etc. The second group trained with highly trained trainers. They were Mark Verstegen's uh, Exos trainers, actually, oh, and we, we added some training to them. So they were highly trained trainers. Then we measured those firefighters when they went back out onto the fire ground. The ones who had good coaching and they were talking about the mechanisms, you know, why it's important not to have knee valgus when you squat, don't curve your back when you're under heavy, all these kinds of things, they transferred onto the fire ground. Yeah. So when the firefighters were pulling a body out of a car or chopping a hole into a burning roof, et cetera, they had more movement competency. The guys who had poor coaches and just got them to do sets and reps, their expertise did not transfer to sure. the fire ground. So th 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 that is so important. But those are the neurological adaptations that occur while you're exercising. Um, muscle, for example, consider the bodybuilder who hypertrophies muscle. Yeah. The actual training session down the muscle at, a, at a, a micro level, and it's the subsequent two days that rebuilds the muscle as it adapts. So that's a two-day turnover cycle. So you're not building muscle while you're training. You're building muscle right. while you're resting and yeah. feeding it. So yeah. that's a that that's a that. A lot of people don't get that. Yeah. Now we get into, uh, say, doing deadlifts as part of a person's training routine where you have to develop denser bone in the vertebra to become resilient against the cluster of uh, back pained mechanisms that power lifters get, which are end plate fractures and eventually uh, disc bulges if, yeah. if they overdrive the tipping point. That's a five-day cycle. So when you look at the grand old men and women of powerlifting, many people in the lay public, they think, oh, that person's really undertrained. They only do deadlifts one day a week. And then they take five or six days for the adaptation because that's the bone turnover and adaptation. Yeah. So you see in biology, we have to honor that tipping point and then think about what the purpose is and what we're adapting. And this helps us converge on much wiser 
uh, sets and reps schedule, but also daily programming of how many days off or what should they be doing on those days off and those kinds of things to pull out the optimal performance and injury resilience. But anyway, there's, there's a little bit of a start. So when we get into things like jujitsu and wrestling, when we're doing stand up, for me to throw a punch, I let's say I trained bench press and thought that was going to increase my punch. Well, actually it doesn't because the, the, the pec major muscle that drives a bench press distal to the ball and socket joint pulls my arm around and flexion, okay. But proximally, where it connects onto my rib cage, it bends my rib cage towards my shoulder. So if all of I, if only if I use my bench press muscle, it's not a very effective uh, punch. Now, if I create proximal stiffness down through my core, 100% of that muscle activation, because I've locked it down on the proximal side, goes to distal uh, athleticism. So that's the world of stand up, tennis, football. Uh, throwing strikes, etc. But now when we get to jujitsu, swimming, and wrestling, the game changed. You're down on the ground. You take a distal pry on the ground, and you might do a shrimp in jujitsu, or a sweep on the ground in wrestling, or an arm bar, or something like that. Now you become a boa constrictor with your spine. So the whole athletic development and how this linkage of our body uh, changes. So the point is you prepare, you build the, uh, the good foundation, but you honor that tipping point and you don't treat the spinal joints like ball and socket joints. So the hips and shoulders yeah. are ball and yeah. socket joints. Yeah. They yeah. are either end of the core. And that's not a coincidence. They're there to transmit the power. But if you create too much power in your core, you really use up that capacity that's under the tipping point much quicker. Yeah. So when even when you look at good wrestling technique and good jujitsu technique, it's still you position the spine to get a good line of drive of the force but the power products still come from the hips and shoulders. The ones who aren't so great generate the power through their spine, and those are the ones who get into trouble. But as you know, in jiu-jitsu, a great set of hips beats a good back any day of the week. Yeah. yeah hips, really, hips, yeah. hips. That's, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> so what's uh, from, what's, uh, from Happy Gilmore? Happy Gilmore. Uh, it's all in the hips. Uh, it's, it's all in the, the hips. hips. Ah, well, I don't know if you want to talk about golf, but 70% <laughs> of the power uh, that, that, that drives the ball in a long drive comes from the hip and external rotation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there you go. Yeah, yeah. If, Happy, uh, Happy Gilmore if, uh, was right. I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of movie references that I thought of because uh, uh, I used to make the case that the Bionic Man had the strongest core in in movie history because he had the he had the fake arm and he could lift these cars and everything. But it's like, well, his core must have been extremely strong then, even exactly. though exactly, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, can we talk about the different trauma accumulation and time, like the sources of injury and how that kind of like how the how are injuries like if we if we backtrack them a little bit like where they're actually coming from like well sit, like yes sitting all day versus, oh, go ahead i cut you off there well yeah yeah uh, of course let, let me answer that first question first then we can okay. talk about sitting all day well uh <laughs> injuries form clusters so people who sit all day have a very characteristic pattern to their to their pain genesis so let, let's take muscle pain muscle pain has a very distinct character and we you know i get so many patients who say oh i've got muscle tightness in my back or muscle pain and very rarely is that the case well, the, 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 there's two major characters to muscle pain one is the that you get this feeling of dis disgorgement or or like a pump consider doing a very heavy farmer's carry so okay. you've walked down the floor with bilateral implements and it's very heavy challenge on quadratus lumborum and the obliques you put down the weights and and you almost want to collapse and your muscles in your core are exhausted 
but after two or three minutes, you're refreshed and ready to go. There's no pain, etc. So that's one very character uh, characteristic of that kind of muscle pain. But the other one is, all right, say you've done reps of something and you get this superficial pain in a muscle and it's it, it may peak eight hours after the fact. The next day there's a bit of stiffness, but the day after it's gone. Now, if you have residual pain and tenderness longer than that, it's not a muscle. It's something a lot. See, muscles often feel and perceive pain but because they're sympathetic to something deeper underneath, be it a disc bulge or a friction nerve root or whatever it happens to be. So, uh, you know, if, if people have pain over their sacroiliac joints and down into their buttocks, it's almost always referred pain from their back. It will be from a disc uh, or something like that that. But when we test it, we'll find out that immediately. If we have them sit and they slouch and that causes a bit of pain, or um, I might pull on the nerve roots with different leg raise, head raise combinations and whatnot. And we'll, we'll isolate down uh, that, muck, uh, that mechanism quite quickly. Um, but anyway, th there's a little bit of a, a start. But sitting um, is, is interesting in that We've never been able to create pain in what we call a virgin back. A person who's never really had back pain before, if all they do is sit, it's not really an issue. But if they go to the gym now for an hour every night and they lift with poor form, yeah. they they sense it they may end up delaminating the collagen, creating a little bit of a disc. But all of a sudden now, sitting is painful after 20 minutes and they go to the gym and they do it again thinking they're going to get strong and beat this out of their back no they won't they will the sitting will remain so it's I, I not love, until the, sorry I, i'm gonna i'm gonna beat my body into submission and then it's gonna like me like right <laughs> so it's it's quite the opposite actually it's yeah. it's having the precision in the assessment that shows the very precise cause of the pain and then you stop it so if it was that person sitting, uh, we'll try a lumbar support. That usually helps while they're sitting. And then as far as their back goes, we should uh, probably be adding a little bit more core stability through exercises that are known as the big three. Uh, I, I know you, you uh, do them at your place. Yeah. And then have a look at the hips. There's a phenomenon called neurogenic inhibition. Uh, I believe we were the first to measure that uh, in, in people. When you get back pain and hip pain, not in everybody, but it's a common pattern, the brain reacts to that pain by inhibiting the gluteal muscles. So when you measure someone getting out of a chair or doing a back bridge or walking up a hill or something like that, they extend their hips in a hamstring dominant way. Their gluteals are inhibited by the brain. Along with that, quite common is neurogenic facilitation to the front muscles, particularly the psoas. And so when they get out of a chair, they have to walk their hands up and it's hard for them to extend their hips and stand up nice and tall. So then, then it's a matter of releasing the psoas muscles. Um, so, you know, it's a house of cards. Stop the original cause, address the psoas, reintegrate the gluteal muscles back into the program. And there's certain ways to do that. Uh, but anyway, th there's a little bit of a thought on uh, those who are now sitting and getting the neurogenic responses yeah. to uh, sitting too much. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think I talk too much sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, please do. I, it's, it's fantastic. It's also fascinating. But yeah, one of the, one of the big takeaways that I think the thing that really, when I was reading your first book, you said you talked about sciatica and one part and you describe sciatica and I had had this hip, this hip thing for so long. And my, I mean, one leg would just, I'd walk around like John Wayne for about three days. I, I had just terrible hip pain and I'd had it since college. And I remember when it happened and no one could ever give me a diagnosis. And I did uh, some hip, some, uh, some nerve flossing where you just sit down, look up, sit, you know, to your like, flex and extend the knee. And I got up and I was like, oh my God, this has been, this has been like 15 years that I've been dealing with this and it's gone. 
And it was just well, I'm I'm so glad to hear. So yeah, it's quite easy to detect uh, nerve root compression and friction and uh, whether or not nerve flossing will help because in many people it has just as much chance to hurt. We call it tickling the dragon's tail. So sometimes <laughs> you'll get burnt and yeah. sometimes it's the most fantastic thing just to clean out that little viscosity rubbing the nerve root and giving the perception of tight hips. And, you know, here are these poor people, they continue to stretch their hips or their hamstrings when really the mechanism was a tighter friction nerve. If we can clean that out, their hips are fine. But the stretching protocol, you will not stretch away pain from a tension nerve. It only makes it even more sensitive, but you get a stretch reflex and this false sign from your proprioceptive system of 20 minutes of analgesia or pain free. So it's a neurological trick. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how valuable. So real quick, just to not brush over that, because I think that's something that general population really needs to hear. How how beneficial is that 20 minutes or is it just detrimental as a whole? I know I'm going off of. Well, uh, well, again, the answer is it, it, it depends. So yeah, stretching, and if the person gets an immediate uh, relief from the stretch, but in 20 minutes or half an hour, they have the feeling or the need to stretch again, chances are they were giving high priority to the stretch reflex and not addressing the original cause of why they were feeling tight in the first place. So with spinal condition and, and tight hamstrings, uh, you know, the physios will say, oh you've got a tight hamstring pull your knees to your chest first thing in the morning before you get out of bed and if we measure that that's simply a stretch reflex 20 minute temporary analgesia we then say no stop it stop pulling your knees to your chest it will feel weird for a few mornings but by the fourth or fifth morning you'll start to get up with a little bit less morning stiffness yeah. now then we'll play a little bit more. We'll say, instead of pulling your knee to your chest, roll over onto your tummy and breathe in. And as you exhale, imagine your low back relaxing into the bed. And what we're doing there is actually breathing a little bit of lordosis into the back. So if they uh, get out of bed and stand up and, and after four or five days say, you know what, that's the best I've felt getting out of bed for a few years. We've just proven that uh, pulling the knees to the chest and stretching was the wrong thing to do. In fact, let's take the pressure off the nerve roots in the way I just described. Yeah. And now we have a evidence base to proceed with the rest of the programming and, and building that pain-free foundation. Uh, and with that, so the topic of flexion and extension, can we go into, cr uh, I know that you don't have all day here, but uh, can we go into crunches here real quick uh, since like obviously that person has an issue with going into that flexion uh, it are, and crunches have been uh, considered almost like the, the front of your ab is basically considered almost like a hamstring for many coaches. What is your take on that as a, as a, as a core exercise? Well, I, I have lots of opinions on that simply because we've measured these things. So we have to uh, define the difference between, say, a sit-up and a crunch. So we do a modified curl-up, which is lifting the head and shoulders off the ground just a tiny bit. So it's a very short-range style of crunch. Um, however, a full sit-up, uh, the discs, as I've already mentioned, are not ball and socket joints. So it's a mistake under load. So you can do a cat camel exercise back and forth on your hands and knees, and it doesn't really stress the discs. But when you add that with load, um, th then the problems come. The collagen fibers that form the disc, see the disc falls into the category of an adaptable fabric. It's fibers. It's not a, a ball and socket joint. And <laughs> excuse me, those fibers over time will slowly work loose and delaminate, and then we'll get problems like disc tears and, and uh, disc bulges and things like that. Interestingly enough, here, the shape of the person's spine really determines this. You can imagine taking a thin willow branch. You can bend that willow branch back and forth, and it never creates stress. But if you took a thicker stick 
and bent it, it would shatter right away. So the bending stresses is a function of thickness. So when you take a very slender boned yoga master, they might be able to do lots of sit-ups and, and some of the jujitsu players fall more into that category. You take a middle linebacker out of the NFL, you'll break their spine much sooner doing sit-ups because of the architecture. However, the little yoga master isn't gonna last one play in the NFL. So do you see how the body, the sports self select certain kinds of body types? That's why different sports have to train differently because the tipping point for each kind of athlete is very different. You can't treat them all the same. And this is what I need adults to hear when they're, when they're training children. They're not many adults. They're, 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 they're quite a different uh, biological beast. But uh, anyway, uh, so uh, then I'll get into the evidence where I've taken several fighters and restored their careers because if they're a jiu-jitsu master or, or an MMA uh, athlete, uh, by tradition, they might do a thousand sit-ups or curl-ups over a gym ball every day. Well, we've and and then by the time they're 23 or 24, they can't train anymore because of back pain. Yeah. Well, then we'll say, yeah. stop doing that. Turn over on the gym ball. Lock up your bitter of the pot, which is now a very heavy abdominal challenge. Yeah. Uh, but it's a moment challenge. It's not a movement challenge. And two things happen their athleticism increases and their pain goes down. Yeah. So they're even punching and kicking a little bit harder. We've measured this. We've done studies on this in Muay Thai fighters. Um, when we look at the U.S. military, who uh, I believe the Navy has gone through this and the Marines and Army are now going through it, and certain factions of the Air Force have already gone through it, they've taken out the speed sit-up test as part of the annual fitness test and yeah. replaced it with a plank time. And the reason for that was they were noticing, it wasn't me, it was them. They, they noticed a, a, a high incidence of back pain associated with a step input of speed sit-ups, which is basic training. And the poor guys who have to pass the test every year, of course, train the test. Uh, but, but once they, they took other groups and did the planks and the, t the style of abdominal training that we're doing. We're not ignoring the muscle, not at all. Um, the the uh, 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 absenteeism from back pain uh, declined. So, you know, I can go on with layer upon layer of, uh, of evidence here, but that's a, a little bit of a start. And, and, you know, think about this, Adam. How many times do people like you or I flex our spine with our rectus abdominis. What we do is use our six pack and our abdominal wall to throw a ball, kick, pull, push a door. This is a short range stiffness spring. Yeah. And when we train it that way, we get much higher athleticism, a much higher capacity because we're building training capacity under that tipping point rather than using it up with uh, loaded bends. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a... Uh... I, I, I think it's spot on. I think it's kind of interesting that we even ever took that, the idea that crunches were a good thing. Cause I, I, other, like if that's what it was meant for, we just had these two big hamstrings right on the front. You know, we'd have these two just real long, loose muscles on the front. We don't have that. We have these like six pack. No, those things. little tendons that cross the rectus yeah. abdominis transmit the hoop stresses around your core yeah. and they link create a short range stiffness spring. So, you know, think of uh, throwing a punch, throwing a baseball, hitting a golf ball, uh, uh, all of those, even sprinting. It's a short range stiffness spring once again. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to take up your whole time, uh, your whole day. And we, uh, um, I, I told you I'd get you out of here by thirty-five minutes. So um, we didn't well, get all the you questions. Know, I, I've got a few minutes. It's, it's your time. It, it, it's okay if you want to uh, do a bit more. I'll leave it to you, though. Okay. Um, well, I could take up. I, I mean, I could just ask you all kinds of questions. But um, what? Well, maybe this is a. I think we've covered that, um, the hip and the spine. What do you think there's some things in the fitness industry that we're doing well and that we could improve upon? Maybe that's a, um, well, how did I ask that? What is the fitness industry doing well or better than they were previously? And what could we improve upon maybe as the, as a wrap up here? 
Yeah. Well, um, in regards to general population, I should say. Yeah, I would have to say things are becoming polarized. I would say in certain groups of the population, they're becoming more ignorant and incompetent in basic movement. And yet another part of the population is becoming so much more aware of movement competency and movement skill. Yeah. I would say the same thing about nutrition. The fabulous nutrition guidance that's available today and what I see people doing with it, it changes people's lives. It changes athletic performance. It's phenomenal. And then I see the polar opposite. I, I see this in coaching, such fabulous, fabulous coaches versus the most pathetic coaches who are not only ruining performance, they're <laughs> causing injury. So right. it's almost that the polarization has created a bigger chasm between the two extremes of really good things and not so good things. So the athletes of today, the top athletes, there's no question. I, I mean, I've been around now, well, 40 years at myself in sports, but only 34 years as a, you know, someone who's supposedly recognized as having some expertise. But in, in that close to 40 years, as I said, the you know when I when I see a hockey player today in the NHL versus a hockey player thirty years ago, they're two completely different animals. Look what's happened in the MMA uh, world. Those guys in the UFC now are so phenomenal. Yeah. And one yeah. of the joys in my life is I get to roll with them a little bit and really feel their skill. And when I get a uh, you know a uh, say a welterweight uh, or a lightweight. And and they're holding me down, and 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 the crush, the 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 the, the mass, it's it's just incredible, and then the speed and the power we get out of some of the big offensive tackles today yeah. is mind-boggling compared to the you know the sort of the big slow guy that they used to put playing offensive tackle yeah. thirty years ago. These oh, are entirely different beasts, yeah. and yet. When I walk through my old university campus, I almost want to cry. The pathetic, pathetic little kids waddling around going to class. These, are, this is the generation where their mother drove them to school, and it's it's just a heartbreaker. Uh, heaven help us if they ever had to defend themselves or their country or anybody else. So you know, and yet. I do have the privilege of working with some of the top military folks who are absolutely phenomenal. So do, do you see what I mean? It's this polarization, I think, yeah. that I would say that's both, at least that that's the way I'm seeing it. Yeah, in many different demographics too. I mean, in the, in the coaching world, there's one side, no, you're stupid, no, you're stupid, no, you're stupid, no, you're stupid. And uh, and uh, I think you're, you're spot on. At one side, like the coaches are just, going to different directions. The people are going, are, are going different directions. The, the more skilled are becoming more skilled and the less skilled are becoming less skilled. And so it's a very <laughs> interesting time to be alive. <laughs> It is. You know, we were talking about, uh, you know, back pain. Is it in the head? And we have this whole group of so-called experts now saying, you know, movement doesn't matter. It doesn't just just keep moving and and don't worry about it, which yeah. is so in incredible. I, I, I get yeah. the most psychologically disturbed patients who've been dismissed by their clinician and they've been told the pain is in their head. They're, what do you mean? I must be crazy. I, you know, I've had one guy who he said, you know, if you can't help me with my pain because the pain clinic said it was in my head, uh, that means I'm crazy and I don't deserve to live. I'm going to put a bullet in my head next week. If you can't help me and, and show me what I need to do to get rid of this pain. And, and that's the distress and dissonance yeah. that some of the people are causing to very solid citizens yeah. who have pain for a reason. And uh, it, it's just a matter of them finding, uh, getting a, a, a proper, caring, yeah. thorough assessment to really find out what the mechanism is. I, I think that that's a good point too. We, we underestimate how big of a deal this stuff really is. Like, oh, you just got some back pain, live with it. Or, oh, just get up and move around. Like, no, it's, th this is the difference between uh, having a, a really great life that you wanted to live and being, not being able to play with your kids, not being able to uh, go on vacation, like constantly being uncomfortable to the point where that guy's like, 
I don't even want to live anymore if I'm just got to live with this for their, forever. Oh, it it's, robs it's, them uh, of their parenting joys. It robs them of playing with their kids. It robs them of joy. caring for their parents. It's it's absolutely huge. I don't dismiss yeah. the emotional side of it at all. Yeah, that's that's but, the, you know, the hard look thing. after everything. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you have to look after the physical and all these impediments as to why they don't get better. You got to face it and yeah. uh, do something concrete about it, but guided with some evidence. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it just, it's a massive deal. It's like what you do. Uh, like if this is one of my things with uh, when people, when coaches are like, you know what makes us different? We really, we care. And I'm like, all right, how many books do you read last year? And like, well, I pick up a muscle and fitness magazine every once in a while. I'm like, all right, well, then you don't care. Like, it, like if you really realized how big of a deal your job is, you'd have a book in front of you every day. Uh, it's, it's, so some of your audience are trainers and some of them are the lay public? Uh, yeah, most of them are the lay public, yeah. Yeah. Let, 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 remember the story I told that performed better, the elderly woman who I assessed? I don't. And. And, and uh, she was going to lose her house. Yes, 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 yes. Would it be worthwhile if I took two minutes and told that story? It's we a do. very powerful story. We, and we it do. shows why trainers and good coaches change people's lives. And in fact, they change lives quite often more than any other medic. Um, uh, it's, it's not uncommon for me to be asked to go to a hospital or a medical group or a school and see three patients on a stage in front of the uh, audience of docs and fellows and surgeons and PTs, et cetera. I was at this one uh, medical facility in, in England and the first patient they brought out was this big rugby player and I assessed him for 20 minutes and declared what I think he should do. The next one was a mid 70 year old woman who was uh, noticeably psychologically distraught. And I talked to her for a few minutes and it turned out, she, she said, you know, I'm, I'm having to leave my home. The physios have told me that when I get up off the toilet, I'm going to fall. And if I fall, no one will find me and no one will feed my cats and all the rest of it. And she was crying. And I said, really, there's a chair. Let's pretend it's a, a toilet, sit down on the chair. And she did the most horrible, incompetent movement and almost fell down onto the toilet. And I said, get up. And it was the same pathetic movement. And then I said, all right, put your hands on your thighs, sniff a little bit of air and go down and play. Well, I, in America, I would say, go play shortstop in baseball yeah. or out center field. And everyone knows what that position is. Yeah. You slide your hands down, you grab your knees and you, and you wait for the, for the ball. But I said, go out and play outfield and cricket. Now she knew that. And I didn't have to do any coaching. And she says, oh, you mean like this? And she slid her hands down her thighs. And I said, grab your knees. But all of her weight was back on her heels. And I said, you're a leaning tower. Push off on your hands. Carry weight down your arms. Now leaning tower through your ankles. Beautiful. Now, don't use your back to stand up. Pull your hips through instead. And she did a beautiful hip hinge to stand up. There was no, that was one repetition, one yeah. cycle of coaching. But the, so the, the point, you know where this is going. And then I said, let's try it again. And I, I changed the shape of the curve of her back and just minor nuances and coaching after that. Not once did she lose any uh, shift her body mass. She was as competent and perfect as can be. And then she got this big smile across her face. And I, I, I said, so, so <laughs> what's up? And she says, do you mean I don't have to leave my home now? And I said, of course not. There's no need. So there was a three minute coaching session that changed her life. And that's what coaches do and good trainers do. Um, it's incredibly important to become a master at the craft. And, and that's how I, I finished up my, my speech at Perform Better, as you know. When you're, when you're doing a job like that, the responsibility is enormous to get it right. And when you're a master of your craft, you, you, you change people's lives. And that's why I'm so pleased with people like yourself to, to promote these educational opportunities and really raise the level of the practice of the craft and uh, make sure that we continue to change people's lives. Yeah, yeah.
that's one of the things when uh, when you said that, well, I, I don't know how much longer I'm going to do these presentations. I was like, no, you can't stop. Like, we need you now more than ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, the travel is, uh, you know, I've been somewhere in the world once a month for 30 years now. Holy smokes. And, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Yeah, I knew that I was being completely selfish when I said that, but I was, I was like, oh, man, you, you, this, is, this is, we need more of this. We need more of the good information, but. Yeah, um, but no. Thing that we, we do do is, I mean, you know, people can read my books. Yeah. Um, but uh, we also put on courses for for medics and and therapists and trainers and whatnot. And if they go to backfitpro.com, they can see the various courses. And uh, we've got a great course coming up with Brian Carroll in in Ohio. Uh, yeah, December. What was December first? Is that when it was? December first. Yeah, what? with. Uh, we we're calling it the gift of injury after our latest book on right. uh, uh, training the back injured strength athlete. Really again. enjoyed that one, by the way. Like uh, as I was reading through it, and I didn't realize how bad his injury had gotten. And oh, it was uh, and, pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You like uh, the part that really hit me was when you said, you know, Brian, you probably shouldn't keep powerlifting, and he's like, "Too bad, I'm going to." And it's like, "All right, well, let's." Let's find a way, and uh, it's pretty uh, pretty amazing that if if he can come back from that and do what he's done, uh, people can walk around without pain. I, it just it's it's unbelievable. Well, you know that this is the thing when you understand, you know, again these rehab guys who say just do exercise, it doesn't matter. It matters a lot yeah. when you understand what the nature of the tissue damage is. You now understand the schedule and what it takes to stimulate a adaptation back to normalcy in that tissue. Yeah. And sometimes it becomes very precise. So yeah. with Brian, you saw the massive fractures. We knew we had to do bone callusing, uh, yeah. uh, which is just an exercise protocol. But uh, it was marvelous the way he remodeled those tissues back. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, um, one of the things that I think there's a there's a all this stuff behind me. All this stuff behind me. Consider, it, it's 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 wonderful for people's health, right? But I'm getting a playback here, so I'm having trouble speaking. But it's wonderful for people's health, but it's also a chainsaw. You have to respect it. And you wouldn't give a chainsaw to a six year old, but speaking of that polarization from coaching, we give so many chainsaws to six year olds and say go train people, uh, in, instead of and the, that's the difference between. Uh, someone that's very skilled and someone that's not. Yeah, you really yeah get some for sure. Quick. But anyway, yeah. um, we can we can wrap this up. And um, what was I going to say? I remember I had something to wrap it up with, but I forgot. <laughs> um, uh, um, well, it, 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 oh yes, I was going to. Where can people go to sign up for the the course in Columbus? Well, uh, the the fastest way is just go to our website backfitpro.com and it's just how it sounds backfitpro.com and they'll see the books awesome. uh and and the videos and and a description of them so they know which one would be most important or appropriate for their purpose and all of our courses are on there as well um well they're worldwide so uh yeah. for the for your audience who lives outside your borders then uh they'll they'll see something that's awesome. possible anyway and where can everybody follow you on social media? Well, truth be known, I don't even know what social media is. My, <laughs> my, my, we have my, my daughter who looks after all of that, but apparently we're on Instagram, yeah. uh, back row, and uh, we're on Facebook. Uh, but uh, after that, I, I, I couldn't tell you what's on there. <laughs> that was almost <laughs> people like a social media. That was almost like a people. Question. How many are there? How many social medias are there? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but yeah, right. uh, I just hear in the news about your president's tweets, so I know what tweet, <laughs> uh, what Twitter is. But I, uh, I don't follow any of that stuff. I stay away from it as much as I can. <laughs> well, it, it's uh, I, I don't get it, but anyway, I don't either. It seems like a really silly. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, we'll stay off of that one. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but good. Um, <laughs> any <laughs> any last words of wisdom that you want to leave the Grid Gym Tribe with? No, not really. Just to uh, uh, keep 
the professionalism as high as possible and to thank you, Adam, for uh, uh, providing the leadership that you do at the gym and uh, in uh, creating all these opportunities for people. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for being on. I really appreciate it. I can't, uh, this means a lot to me. I just, uh, I, I've been following your stuff for a long time and definitely changed uh, my career and my, my life really not to sound dramatic or anything, but, uh, I was living with a lot of pain for a very long period of time. And, and it was getting to the point where I was wondering if I was even going to be able to do this anymore. Uh, cause it just wasn't happening, but yeah, it made a huge difference. So thank you. Great. Let yeah. the clients pick up their own weights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Okay. All, All right. right. Well, thank you very much. Bye for now. Yep.